Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Natalia would have mentioned, my name is Shana Challenger. I am from Antigua, um, and I am here today to talk to you about an eradication that we, a successful island restoration, I should say, that we were able to complete um, when I was in my old position, which was um, coordinator of the rest, Redonda Restoration Program. Um, and I'd like to thank Epic, Natalia, Juliana, the whole team for inviting me to speak today. Um, thank you again for the opportunity and buckle yourselves in because we're going to be going on a ride. So again, this is Restoring Redonda, which is the beautiful island that you're seeing on the screen. Um, and again, I'm from the Environmental Awareness Group, aka the EAG, and our motto is for the benefit of people and wildlife. So here be dragons. This story is the story of the mysterious island of Redonda and its wildlife. Sorry, I didn't check that y'all were able to see this, this slide. Somebody just give me a, okay, I see Natalia's saying, oh, yeah, okay, great. <laughs> so here be dragons, the mysterious island of Redonda and its wildlife. So Redonda is actually the third island of Antigua and Barbuda. Um, and as you can see, it is our long lost, kind of far away, flung away um, sister island. Um, she's actually a lot more closer to Montserrat and Nevis. It's actually 30 miles from Antigua. Um, it's about 300 meters high, 80 hectares in size, um, one mile long, basically. And a lot of people like to say, how oh, Antigua even got that? I don't know, take it up with the queen, but Redonda belongs to Antigua and Barbuda, right? And so Redonda, as the name, the Spanish name sounds, it is a Spanish word meaning round. And when Christopher Columbus was sailing um, on his quest for the islands, um, he had an artist with him. And here you can see the artist's impression of what Redonda used to look like in 1493. So you see the lush vegetation, you see all of the birds in the air, um, you see the beautiful round um, island ahead of you. This is what Redonda looked like when we saw it in 2008. It was deforested, eroded, and as you can see, collapsing into the sea. You can literally count the number of trees that were actually on the island. But even though it looked so bad, Redonda was still globally recognized as an important bird and biodiversity area and a key biodiversity area because of the many species that were still calling it its home. So it was still important for wildlife such as brown boobies, um, over 20% of the brown boobies in the Eastern Caribbean and actually 1% of the entire global population of brown boobies can be found on Redondo, as well as over 50% of the mass booby populations in the Eastern Caribbean. We have our cute little family here, um, the cotton balls, as I like to call the chicks. <laughs> And even though we had these high numbers, there was still not anything compared to the numberless seabirds that were described on Redonda in the 1800s. So in addition to birds, and this is a bird, <laughs> a bird working group, but you know, I have to bring in the other, um, you know, reptiles, birds, close-ish, right? <laughs> so I have to bring in the other um, species that were found there. Um, all of the reptiles on Redonda are critically endangered, including the Redonda tree lizard, the Redonda ground dragon, and the Redonda pygmy gecko, which was only scientifically dis described in 2009. It still doesn't even have a scientific name. Um, it's that new. <laughs> Um, in addition to the wildlife, of course, um, there were some rare and unusual lichens and plants, such as the jumping cactus, which really does jump as you're passing by, <laughs> as you can see with Taya here. Um, but even though we have all of this wildlife that was able to persist, where was the forest, the songbirds, the iguanas, the agaves, the burrowing owls that used to call this beautiful island its home? So we get into now what happened, this recipe for disaster. What were the causes of Redonda's ecological crisis? 
So from 1865 to 1914, seabird guano was mined on Redonda with over a hundred people calling it their home. And at that time, seabird guano was basically gold and it was being used as ammunition in World War II, as well as for fertilizer for farms. So um, they had a permanent establishment over on Redonda. And those guano miners left behind with them a huge population of rats. Um, as you can see, they, I don't know if anybody has ever seen a rat climb a cactus before, but this is what they were doing on Redonda. As you can see, they were having just devastating effects on the vegetation, also on the reptiles, that beautiful ground dragon I just showed you. And of course, on the vulnerable chicks and eggs that were there. In addition to the rats, they also left um, a number of feral Spanish goats on the island, um, which have these beautiful horns, but as you can see, his ribs are literally showing. And the issue was that because there was hardly anything to eat and no fresh water available, every time we would visit the island, we would see carcasses all over from the goats having died from starvation. So if we could remove all of the rats, bring over all of the goats, could this damaged ecosystem and its wildlife ever recover? And so we started forming up the plans and partnerships needed to save Redonda through joined up thinking. So first of all, the EAG, like I said, our motto is for the benefit of people and wildlife. And we are Antigua and Barbuda's oldest environmental NGO. And we have successfully restored islands through invasive species removal since 1995 with major benefits for wildlife and people. Um, here you can see some fixed point photographs, which we um, find very useful in showing the impacts of our work. Um, you can see 1995 when rats um, were still present on Great Bird Island, and you can see here the difference in 2012. And there's a vegetation, biomass, and diversity that has increased on islands that are cleared of rats. So in addition to that, we realized that um, the entire ecosystem as well. The rest of the other species were also benefiting from the removal of rats. So here you can see species like our laughing gulls or sooty terns or noddies, et cetera, their numbers going up once rats were removed. And interestingly, every single time we compare, because we do work not only on the islands that we've restored, but we also have a control of the islands that still have rats present and their no seabirds do not breed on islands where there are rats present. So building on that experience, we also had several meetings with the government and stakeholders to present findings and to discuss potential solutions. How were we going to get this Redonda project off of the ground? And luckily rats, nobody likes rats. And so there's a full agreement that the rats had to go. But what were we going to do about the goats? Because as you all know, Caribbean people, we're very sympathetic to goats. We wanna eat goat water. That's one of our local delicacies here, right? And so what were we going to do about these species that were simultaneously dying and simultaneously causing a problem? As you can see, they were all suffering um, and it would have been inhumane actually for us to leave them over there to die. And so we reached a consensus to bring them into captivity and bring them to the mainland. And thus the Redonda Restoration Program Steering Committee was born and the project was launched in May of 2016. Um, and I started working in August, the August 2016, straight out of UE and began the Redonda Restoration Program. So now that we've had the committee together, it was finally time to start eradicating the rats. And so we're introducing the rat pack. So as I would have said, the EAG, we have successfully eradicated rats and mongooses and other um, invasive mammals from the offshore islands using a standard method of um, poisoning using clarat, um, which is 
um, a poison that has an activite ingredient of brodificum, basically causing internal bleeding in the rats. Um, and this is specific to mammals. So even though other um, creatures such as crabs may eat it, it has no effect on them. It is very specific for the rats. And although we had all this experience doing this in the past, Redonda posed novel difficulties. For the first time, it was somewhere that's extremely remote. You can only get there by helicopter. It's extremely unstable. You see these cliffs, <laughs> um, you know it was a brand new challenge. And so we assembled a team of skilled staff and volunteers from Antigua, St. Vincent, New Zealand, UK and Ireland. Um, you can see our team leader right there, she's from New Zealand, and pull together this team that was going to have the distinct pleasure of getting Redonda's rats to go. And so six of the team members were expert climbers who would abseil on the cliffs on the side to target the rats that were living there. And this is actually where we were living. This is where we were staying, right there in case you can't see. <laughs> and we lived over there for two months. So no running water, no Wi-Fi, no electricity, just birds and lizards. And it was a great time. <laughs> um, and so for, the, for the, those two months, this is actually inside of where we were staying, inside of the manager's house. So one of the buildings that would have been there from the mining area has still survived to this day. And that's where we would have our little kitchen, um, hang out in the hottest parts of the day and plan our routes. And these are our tents and where we were sleeping in the night. So for those two months, rat bait was distributed every 40 meters. Basically, um, when you're putting down rat bait, you have to make sure that you're putting it somewhere that every rat has an opportunity to encounter it. And so by putting it within the rat's home range, checking and replenishing them daily, we were able to cover a lot of ground, as you can see with the slide that's up. Um, you can see different letters. And so each one of those would represent lines that we would do every single day checking um, and replenishing the bait. And so you can see here um, a video of the rats actually lining up to be able to eat the bait. Um, one of the things that was a major um, thing to, to take note of is that we did this during the driest season, which was in March, April. And so the rats were extremely hungry. Um, you really to make sure that it's most effective, you do it when um, they're at their hungriest and the bait uptake was um, extremely fast, as you can see, literally lining it up. Um, I will also note that for the poisoning, for them to die, they only need to eat a quarter of the block. And as you can see, they were gorging it off. And so they were so hungry that the rat population collapsed within literally two weeks. Um, 90% of the females that we caught were either pregnant, nursing, or about to go into heat. So it was actually very good that we had done it at that point. Um, the rats that did die on the surface, we did take with us, well, not take with us, but we did bring back to camp and do a dissection to make sure that it was the rat poison that was killing them. And no signs have been detected of rats on Redonda since March, 2017. So now that the rats were done, it was get your goat, time to relocate the goats from Redonda to Antigua. And so we built a self-mustering corral in the goat's favorite part of the island, which is basically the only flat part kind of near to where the helicopter lands. Um, and as you can see, um, we really thought we were ingenious with this. You see there's like a, um, some shade, there's water, um, we have, um, we, we really thought that this would have been so enticing to the goats. Um, we also have these spare gates. Um, and as you can see, they are built in a way that once the animal goes in, they can't get out because they lock. So we put up the corral with um, help from the Ministry of Agriculture and we were ready. The goats are all going to come in. We're going to catch them so easily. They ignored the corral for months. <laughs> they completely ignored it. Um, we actually had a goat relocation team leader, Peter Havison, who actually came and had to test alternate methods such as snares, as you can see in the picture on the right. But once you've caught the goat, wherever it is, you still then had to pick up the goat and walk the entirety of Redonda back to the corral to put them in. And so for months, we had only caught one goat who we named Juan because he was the only one 
that we had. Um, but eventually, we were able to get success by cornering the goats against the fences and catching them by hand. So once we, what we would do is we would catch the kids, which would then bring them females. And then with every species, once the females are there, you know, the men came after us. So we were able to very quickly at that point be able to get um, all of the goats off of the island. And um, we actually, like I said, hand captured all of them. All of them were flown inside of the helicopter, not underneath like in the movies, but sitting inside with us. Um, that is Noodle in the bucket that I'm holding. Um, and there's my um, former boss, Jenny, holding, um, I think the goat Jenny as well. <laughs> um, and as you can see, we have the goats in goat bags to make sure they didn't, you know, poop up the helicopter, um, also covered their heads so that they thought it was nighttime and would be very calm. And they were also had their um, front and back legs um, tied together to make sure that they couldn't move around too much. And so once the goats were um, brought to Antigua, they were placed in the care of the Ministry of Agriculture's Veterinary and Livestock Division and with some private veterinarians as well. And so, home improvement. Are there any signs of habitat recovery now that we have removed the rats and the goats? I wonder if there was. Let's see. Okay, so this is July 2016. Right before the project was about to start. And then this was one year after. And this was without bringing any species over to help with recolonization or anything. Nature really just said, just help us get rid of the rats and we're good. <laughs> so yeah, you can see the big change that happened within just a couple of months of invasive species removal. And so um, a key part of our work was, of course, monitoring the changes to um, the plants, lichens, birds, etc., while the restoration was happening. So we had from before, during, and after. Um, and interestingly enough, um, natural recolonization of the land birds happened pretty swiftly. Um, within a couple of months, we were already seeing land birds finally coming to the island. Um, I remember the first time I saw a green-throated carib and I was like, what are you doing here? It's too soon. There's no flowers yet. <laughs> but the fact that the land birds were even able to come to Redonda, to see Redonda, to, you know, consider it as somewhere they would possibly stop over was just completely invaluable. Um, actually, up to the last time we went, which was in May, we actually saw a catalegue right over there as well. So they're coming, they're coming. And so within only a few months of removing the rats and goats, we saw an increase in plant biomass, more species of land birds, increases in butterflies and other invertebrates, a fall in predation on inverts, bird eggs, chicks, lizards, the first bat even. So within only a few months, some very visible changes. And now I wanna just briefly share about the secrets of success. How was it that this was able to happen? How was it able to happen so successfully as well? And the first thing was that there was a recognized need for multi-stakeholder collaboration for the success of the Redonda Restoration Program. EAG, we could not have done it alone. And it was a mammoth task that was only accomplished because of all of us working together. The next thing is that we benefited from um, EAG's long experience of over 20 years of island restoration and invasive alien species control. And then of course, having skilled personnel and diverse international partners, each bringing complementary expertise that helped see our vision come through. And then of course, having donors and other supporters who understand the power of restoration and knew the potential that Redonda had to be a conservation success story. So restoring habitats and tackling harmful alien invasive species is crucial and can show surprisingly speedy results. 
And you're probably wondering where are we now? That was 2017, 2018, where are we now? Um, Redonda and its surrounding sea is actually about to be designated as the first protected area under the Environmental Protection and Management Act here. Um, and we are also, we've also received funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do a feasibility study for reintroduction of the melodistic iguana or of the borrowing owl. Um, having annual wildlife monitoring trips to continue um, documenting the island's recovery. And of course, quarterly biosecurity trips where we visit and replenish the bait in our permanent bait stations to make sure that the island's rat-free rat status is not compromised. All right, and now I have to, of course, say a big thank you to all of our donors, partners, field personnel, supporters, et cetera, who are all listed on this slide. And then with that, I say thank you and ask if there are any questions. Oh, thank you.